Well, it's great to see you all here today as uh, we are continuing in our series in the book of Philippians. What we've been looking at is where the Apostle Paul writes a letter to this church because they found out he was in prison. And so they sent a love offering. And so this is his letter encouraging them. It was also a thank you letter. And so first things first on Father's Day to remind us, men, yes, we can write thank you letters. It is possible. Paul has shown us that it is possible. We can do the same thing. You might need to write a nice thank you letter uh, for Father's Day even uh, if they took good care of you. But out of that, when you start looking at what Paul writes to them about, he wanted them to know how he was doing in prison. Because that was the whole point of the, of the letter. And, and so the, the, when you look at the theme of Philippians, the number one theme is joy. How does someone who is in prison write a letter on joy? And that's because joy is not based on our circumstances. We understand joy is not the same thing as happiness. You know, good things happen, you're happy. Bad things happen, you're unhappy. But joy can allow us to rise above our situation, above our circumstances. Sometimes we can have joy in spite of our circumstances. And it's not always easy, but that's what the kind of joy that we want to pursue in our lives as well. And the Apostle Paul is writing from Rome. Now, Paul always wanted to get to Rome. He truly desired to be in Rome. Rome was the center of the known world. If he could get the gospel there, it could go everywhere else in the known world. He just didn't get there the way he planned it. You know, he wanted to go into the marketplace. He wanted to be able to share the power of the gospel with anybody that could hear. But instead, he comes to Rome in in chains, actually. He's going to go on, on trial. It takes about two years for him to go through that entire process. So while he's there, he's under house arrest. They allowed him to have a place to stay. That's part of what that love offering from Philippi would have provided was pay for his housing. But for 24 hours a day, he was chained to a Roman soldier. Six-hour shifts, four times a day, there was a new soldier. No privacy, no getting around it, no going to the marketplace. He was stuck there all the time. And yet he could write a book about joy. And so we've been looking at that uh, in, 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 our, in our study because he tells us to not be anxious about anything. If anybody was to be anxious, it's someone who's facing life or death situations. Does he, does he end up being beheaded for his faith or is he going to be vindicated? We didn't know at this point, neither did Paul. And yet he could still write about that joy. And so we run into a passage this week that seems to run counter to everything we know about Paul. When you look at Paul, you see someone who's decisive. He takes action. He doesn't, he's not passive. He's not waiting for things to happen. I mean, he is going to, he's a go-getter. So as soon as he becomes a follower of Jesus in the book of Acts, I mean, everything is centered around Jesus. And so he goes on his first missionary journey. Now, all of Paul's missionary journey started in Antioch. That was the Christian center uh, of the world when it came to um, Gentile Christians. You think Jerusalem for Jewish Christians, but he was always launching out of Antioch. And he goes to this place on his first missionary journey called Lystra. He's made it to, and you know, he left Antioch, he goes to Iconium, he finally ends up in Lystra. At that place, people come to know Christ, miracles are performed, people are healed, things are going well. But some Jewish leaders from uh, Antioch follow him to Lystra. And in Acts chapter 14, you read that they worked up the crowd and they take Paul and they stone him. They pick up rocks and literally stone him to death, they think. They drag him outside the city and they leave him for dead. They think he's dead. And then the believers come outside. They see see Paul. They go and gather around him. He gets up. And at this point, this is where we see that picture of Paul that many of us love because he could have just gone on there. The next place was called Derby. He could have left Lystra and went straight to Derby and never looked back. But instead, it says he got up. He went back in the city and stayed the night. Like, who does that? These people have just tried to kill him. And Paul was willing to get back up. I mean, he's still got a broken body at this point. Walks back into the city, stays the night, encourages the brethren and leaves the next day. I mean, that's the kind of person we see in Paul. I mean, he was always willing to to take a stand for his faith. He always knew what was next. But today we're looking at Paul right this. He says, I'm hard pressed on all sides. I don't know which decision to make. I don't know which choice to make. Like that's not the normal Paul. He gets real honest with the Philippian church of what he's dealing with. And you know, when I think about this for application, whether you're in school or retired or anywhere in between, if you're in school, we all face times where we have decisions to make. Paul's decision was not right versus wrong. He didn't know which was best. And sometimes you're going to be faced with those kinds of decisions. How do you know which is the best 
decision to take. But also, he is dealing with life and death in this situation. And for some, maybe you're retired and you're saying, you know what, I have, I have done my job. I have passed on the baton. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back, you know, uh, or, or, or until he takes me home. Like, I'm done. And what we see in Paul's life is he tells us that in those moments, until God calls you home, he is not done with you, and he has a work and a plan for you in life. And we need to finish the race. We need to fight the good fight, as we're going to see today. So we get to see all of that application just kind of in Paul's own life and some of the things he was struggling with. And we find that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. So I invite you to turn there. I will pick up at the second half of verse 18. Last week, we looked at verses 12 through 18. And it's uh, the guy that wrote most of the verses in the Bible was doing it on horseback. And apparently at times he would just mark the wrong part. There's nothing sacred about the numbers in our Bibles. And so the second half of verse 18 actually goes with our part today. But what he's talked about to this point was he was telling us that it was actually a good thing that he was in prison. That God was using it for his glory and for the gospel. In fact, the Roman soldiers that thought that Paul was chained to them, it was the other way around because they walked in and got hooked up to a missionary who gave them six hours of the gospel. They got to hear uh, what he was writing out these letters to these other churches. He got to hear him encourage the other believers. And then at night when no one else was around, they got the, the, the apostle Paul. And some of those uh, Roman soldiers, the Praetorians, these were the special soldiers that also would have guarded Caesar become followers of Christ. He says, it's even going up into Roman leadership. I even mentioned last week that if it had not been for his imprisonment, we wouldn't have had some of the letters that we have. And I, I did misspeak because we wouldn't have had Philippians because it's a thank you note for giving him a love offering for being in prison. He would have just gone to them. He would have gone to the church at Ephesus. He would have gone to the church at Colossae. But instead, he writes these letters that we now have. I mentioned uh, Galatians as one of those prison letters, and he did not write that while in prison. So I want to correct that. But we would have missed out on Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians if it had not been for his prison time. And we can see those passages. We looked at that last week, some of the passages out of that. So when we get into this, he's saying, now, even though I'm in prison, there's some people preaching Christ for the wrong reasons. He says, whether they're preaching it for the right reason or the wrong reason, I will rejoice because the gospel is being preached, and that's all that mattered to him, that Jesus, uh, the gospel of Jesus was going forth. And so he ends that by saying this in verse 18, yes, and I will rejoice. And he says, goes on in verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So I'm going to unpack a few verses at a time today. Uh, there's some word studies in this because so much stands out when you read the, this passage. But he says, for I know. He doesn't guess. He's not hoping. He says, I know something. I know that through their, your prayers, the church's prayers, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, when we hear the word deliverance, uh, you might think, well, that means he's, he knows for sure that he was going to get out of prison, that he was going to be released. That's not what this means. He's going to make that very clear in the next couple of verses. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die, but either way, it will be for his deliverance. Um, the word for deliverance here in the language of the New Testament is the same word where we get salvation. Uh, it is, there's no name given among men whereby we must be saved. This is the same mindset here. It is salvation, but it's not just that salvation that he receives because he's placed his faith in Jesus. That was also used for other things. Uh, in this context, it could mean his ultimate deliverance uh, before uh, court, that he would be released from prison, uh, that he would be vindicated uh, in the courts before human authorities, or it could mean his final salvation in the presence of Jesus. He said, either way, there's victory in this. No matter what happens, what you see is Jesus is at the center of everything he does. And that's why he can say, I rejoice. The word joy or rejoicing is found 16 times in the book of Philippians. It's a little over 100 verses. That's a lot of words. A lot of times you use the word joy or rejoicing. And we see it here. We're going to see it again in this passage. But I love how he says there's two things that he, that he knows will help provide him with that deliverance. The prayers of the church and the spirit of Jesus Christ helping him. He asked for the prayers of the church. When you start getting into faith and you start learning about God, uh, one of the things that we run into is like we learn we're supposed to pray, but we also learn that God is all powerful and God is all knowing. So why don't we even pray if he can do whatever he wants? 
And right here, Paul valued prayer. If we only think of prayer as our to-do list for God that he needs to do to fill our will, then yeah, why would we ever need to pray? Because we're just telling God what to do, and he's got to follow us. Like, uh, you know, we say the magic words in Jesus' name, so God has to do what I say. That's not how it works. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer is a conversation with God. If you say you're in a relationship with someone and you never talk to them, you never speak to them, you never listen to them, that's not much of a relationship. When you talk about knowing Jesus, it's about having that conversation. He said, I am thankful for the prayers of the church. They were praying for him. And what happens when we pray, prayer doesn't change God, prayer changes us. That's not a quote from me, that's just one that's out there. Prayer begins to change us. When you begin to pray for somebody, when you begin to pray for your enemies like Jesus calls us to, it changes how you see the person you call an enemy. When you start praying for God to work in someone's life, sometimes and most of the time he tends to use you as the solution. He's going to call you into that situation. That's why he laid it on your heart to be praying for them, but it changes and helps us to align our will to what God wants to do in and through us. But it's a conversation. And I, I bring all this up. I just love that it's the idea of praying here because um, I've missed that as a church body. And here's what I mean by that. Six months ago, I can't believe it's been six months, I've been skipping Wednesday night prayer meeting for six months. And the reason for that, there was a good reason. I, I, I told somebody uh, this morning that, and they said, don't worry. We know you were in a good place doing what you needed to do. But when we found out our, our youth minister, Ben, was leaving to go do graduate work, and he was going to be gone in January, you know, we had so much momentum in our students. We had several had accepted Christ over the last half a year, and we didn't want to lose that momentum. So what we did uh, was until we found a student minister, I jumped into student ministry. And so on Wednesday nights, I'm giving 100% to our students. And we had Nathan Hamilton come in, and he gave 100% to our Wednesday night prayer meeting with adults. Um, and then that momentum carried forth to in February at the Disciple Now weekend when several more made decisions to follow Christ. Others felt that call to deeper walk with God. We call it rededicating or whatever you want, but it's understanding that I'm going to follow Jesus. And so I've enjoyed that time with our students. I've truly loved it, guys. Uh, and ladies, there's a couple of them now. And when we first started, when I got here, there was like, it was the broiest youth group you've ever seen. And Ben had like, uh, we had foosball, chipping and putting. I mean, it was like, Everything has changed in, in there uh, since then. And so out of that, I've missed our prayer time, though. Because Jesus said, my, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. And last summer was some of the sweetest time that I had as a church, as a pastor. Because for me, this is just, just to hear me out. And this is stuff we get to do on Wednesday nights. When Last summer, I got to share a little bit about, you know, where are we at as a church? I remember saying, we're going to grow this summer. And I kept hearing this same phrase. Uh, churches don't grow in the summer around here. Churches take off in the summer. Christians take off in the summer. And I kind of, I like that little challenge in front of me of like, you know, I've never taken off in the summer. You grow in the summer. And so I don't even know, like, how do I do an 80% sermon? Like, I'm going to give 100% either way. Like, there's, I don't know how to throttle that back or, or save some energy. You know, this is just who I am. But it's the same for Wednesday nights. And we grew last summer. You may not see it because we got people on vacation. I get that. But new people were coming in, and they were responding and, and connecting and becoming members and, and becoming regular attenders. This, this is what was happening last summer. We got to talk about it on Wednesday nights. We got to pray about it. And so my, my de desire is that Sunday should be the culmination of our worship through the week. And this would be great. But Wednesday should be the cherry on top where we gather and we worship together and we pray together and we just simply fellowship together. Um, there will be times when we worship and we pray and then I'll, I will teach. And that's good. But there are some weeks where we don't even get to the teaching because we spent so much time in worship and in prayer. And that's even better to me. That is a sweet, sweet time as a church. And getting to kind of pray about what God wants to do. Because here's what we see. He saw that without the, the prayers of the church and the spirit of Jesus, it was not going to be accomplished what needed to be accomplished. If we're going to be a people that accomplish what God wants to do in this community, it's going to be because we're people of prayer. And the help of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus. That's what's going to change it. Uh, but we should be bathing these things in prayer. Spending time seeking God's will. Uh, just like we see in here. But he also uh, says at the end of that, um, that this will turn out for my deliverance. So understanding that either way, 
This is going to be okay. He wanted them to know, I'm okay either way. But he goes from that. He talks about it in verse 20. He says, as it is my eager expectation and hope. This is what he's hoping for now. He said, I know this, but here's my hope. I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. No matter what happens, Jesus is at the center of his life. Whether he lives or dies, it is a victory uh, for us to know that Jesus is to be the center of our life, that he is our king and he is worthy of the throne of our hearts. And so we'll, we'll unpack that a little more in a section, but to get to the point where we live or die, there is a victory. Um, the only way that happens, where there can be victory in their life or in death, is if Jesus is at the center, if Jesus is on the throne. If Jesus is not the throne of your life, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then this is the best life that there is because the next one is apart from Christ. And you should be going after all the things that the, everybody else in the world goes after. But if Jesus is at the center, we have a far greater expectation and a hope. And that's what he's talking about here. So now we come into one of the most famous verses in Philippians and really in the, in the Bible. It's where Paul says this in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's all been building to this with the, his understanding here. And uh, uh, this is not original with me, but one pastor mentioned that when you look at this in the language of the New Testament, and I've said that a lot because there's just been a lot of word studies in this. There's just, there's depth in this uh, passage today, but he says there's not even a verb between living and Christ. It literally reads, for me to live, Christ. He said, it's almost as if Paul didn't want anything, even a verb between his life and Christ. Uh, it's a picture of, for me to live, Christ. If I die, Christ. Ever, either way is gain. That's what he's talking about in here. Um, and so the victory here uh, is not just the picture of heaven that we're sometimes taught, you know, angelic little babies with wings playing harps and, you know, what is heaven going to be like? You know, there's the street of gold, there's crystal sea. That's not what Paul is yearning for. When he's talking about when his death is gained, that is not the result. Heaven is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the presence of Jesus, the presence of Christ. For me to live, Christ. To die, Christ. I will be in the presence of Jesus. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was that thief on his side. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Not next week, not after you work your way through purgatory, none of those things. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He knew that when the day comes, when they would separate his head from his body, he would be with Jesus. And he could rejoice in that. He longed for that, actually, as we're going to see in here. Um, but when he talks about to die is gain, um, I'm going to ruin a passage for some of you. Uh, I'm not even going to quote where, where the passage is, so you just uh, I'll have to look it up for yourself. But when Jesus is talking about, I'm going away, it's the Gospel of John. I can't go any further than that. I'll, no more spoilers. But he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And he says, in my Father's house are many what? Mansions. And if I go, I will return and bring you to myself. I had someone, I have heard some great sermons and some great songs that talk about, I've got a mansion waiting for me in glory. And then I got to seminary and I had a professor ruin that passage for me. And I'm probably going to ruin it for some of us today. Not I don't like ruining things. I don't like to just, you know, some people are just like, they just don't like good things and they don't want it to happen. I'm not doing it for that reason. But hear me out. In 1611, when the King James Version was written into English, the word mansion had a very different meaning than it means today. There's a lot of words that have changed over time, but that one has definitely changed. When we think about mansions today, we think about that 20-bedroom, 10-bath house, $20 million mansion, okay? Um, back then, it meant dwelling place. It meant room. It was a very humble thing. But over time, we've kept the word mansion, and the word evolved, but not the translation, and so I've heard people talk about trying to describe, you know, what's, the, what's my mansion going to be like? Am I going to have hardwood floors and granite countertops? And they spend, you know, they're really entertaining. I mean, these pastors really get into it, and you're just listening, granite countertops, what kind of chandelier? Because I've got a mansion waiting for me in glory. And then you realize the streets are made with gold. 
The most precious metal we have on this earth is what we walk on in heaven. It's not about how we can bring earth into heaven. It's about our goal is to bring heaven to earth. And these things about our mansion, that's not our reward. Our reward is Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. Our reward in heaven is the presence of Jesus and nothing else. The street of gold does not matter. We won't even care about those things because we'll be so enamored with our king. And so when we get into that, I know some of you have heard that and that ruined a lot of good messages or some really good songs, and I'm sorry. But that really is a picture of prosperity gospel. How can we take earth with us to heaven? Because if we get it in heaven... It's sad, you know, we're supposed to be satisfied in heaven. We're saying that earthly things can satisfy and only Jesus satisfies. That's why I brought that up. I have held on to that for two years. I don't just ruin things just for the sake of ruining things. But I knew that for some, we've heard that. I've heard those songs and heard those stories. But what does Paul talk about? He talks about Christ. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Death will be a gain because everything in his life has Jesus holding it together. He is the anchor that holds everything together in the storms of life. He is the cornerstone that provides direction and order for everything that Paul faced in his life. Paul, first missionary journey, gets stoned by the people of Lystra. He goes back in. Uh, the second missionary journey, when he goes to Philippi, he gets beaten with rods and thrown in prison. That's where the church actually was birthed out of a, a midnight uh, prayer service and worship service happening in the prison. I mean, this is happening to him. He gets shipwrecked. He gets bitten by a snake. Before it's over with, he will give his life for the sake of the gospel. And he was not in prison because he was a bad guy. He was in prison for sharing the gospel. Remember that. He wasn't in prison and then saw the light. This is what he was facing. And so if he doesn't die, he goes on to other things. And that's what he's going to try to unpack for a second. He's like, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But now, how do we understand that? So luckily, Paul gives us his reasoning. He says, for if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. It's like, if I live, if I'm let off and I get to continue on, there'll be more missionary journeys. Jews and Gentiles in the marketplace will come and hear the gospel. Lives will be changed. That is, sounds really good, but I can't choose. He's choosing. I can't choose if I'd rather be beheaded in Rome or go on living. That was the challenge for him because he knew to live is Christ, but to die was even better. So he says, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire, my deepest desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that would be far better. He faces two options. He's pressed in on these two sides. If you're, a, if you're claustrophobic, you know that feeling of the walls closing in. It's like it's so hard you can't breathe. You just don't know what to do in those moments. He says this is what it feels like for him. He's describing that picture of being pressed in on both sides, one by life and one by death, and he doesn't know which is the better option. He says my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. The word depart is the picture of breaking camp. Have you ever set up camp? You set everything up, you stay there a while, you break camp, you get everything ready for the next destination, the next part of your journey. To depart was also used with ships when they would take the ropes off of the dock and untie it to take on the next part of the voyage. Paul knew that to depart was not the end of this journey, it was the beginning of a new journey with Christ. And he says, and that is far better. But he goes on to say, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. If I stay convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Again, there's that word joy. I think I'm going to live through this is what he's saying. Now he's worked this out while he's writing it almost. You know, hey, maybe Paul talks to think like I do. But so he starts off, I don't know where to land, but I'm pretty sure by the end he's talked himself into realizing, I think I'm going to be here a little longer. He says, so that in you, so in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul longs to be with Christ, to be in his presence. That was everything to Paul. But he knows that if he lives, it's because God isn't done with him yet. But to live is Christ, to die is gain. Could that be said of you today? If, if your kids described you, could they say, for, for dad to live is Christ? Or would it say, would, they, would someone describing your life look at your life and say, for dad to live is his job? For dad to live is his kids. For mom to live is her kids. 
for mom to live as her job, her hobby, his desires? Or would they be able to say, for me to live is Christ? Could they describe you that way? If there is anything else on the throne of your life, then you're missing out on the joy that we're called to. This isn't about trying to talk people into doing something just because it makes you feel better or anything like that. I'm simply saying you want joy in your life, real joy that goes beyond our circumstances and our understanding, then Jesus has to be on the throne of our lives. For us to live is Christ, and then everything else can fall into place as a result of that. That's why he's the linchpin, the cornerstone that holds it all together. And so Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Can that be said of you? Uh, he says, if I am to live, though, I'm going to bless others. I'm going to, to help because I know God's not finished with me yet. And it turns out God wasn't finished with him yet. He goes on to a second and third missionary journeys, but eventually he gets arrested again. And this time he's facing Rome, imprisonment, and he knows his time is up. He's facing death. And he writes to his protege, Timothy, um, and he tells him at the end of his life, some things that he saw. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, this is what Paul says. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race and I have kept the faith. He didn't quit when he got acquitted the first time. He kept on fighting the good fight. He finished the race. And I want to encourage you, maybe some of you feel like that you saw the race as a, as a relay race, you know? You got to a certain age and you handed that baton and you let the young ones do it and, and, and walking with Jesus and, and, and church or whatever it is. This is not a push for volunteers if you're not volunteering. Uh, we always need more volunteers. That's not, that, 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 there's nothing new with that. This isn't about that. This is about your joy of following Jesus to the end. Because if you are not dead, you are not done. God is not done with you. Will you finish the race? Don't tap out before the fight is over. Keep the faith. That's what Paul did. And he encourages us through that. And so we're going to get to see that and continue on in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, was, I was reminded of this, just this challenge for a minute. Uh, when I first planted a church in Tennessee, I was senior pastor of a church plant, which is easy when there's two of you. I mean, it, it sounds really big and bad, but it was just two of us at the time, Amy and me. And um, we didn't even have pets to count as like an animal ministry or anything like that. It was just us. And um, we joined the local association, and all the other pastors were much more old, uh, mature than me. Okay, let's just say that. They were way more mature than me. I was the young guy in the association at that time. And I would hang out with them, and we'd pray together. And you know what? The older they were, the more they wanted to talk about end times. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the last times, it's the end of days. This was 20 years ago. That's all they wanted to talk about. And at the time, I was a little cynical. I was a little judgmental. I'm like, you just want to talk about Jesus coming back because you're tired. You're like, you're just ready for him to come back because you're tired of doing this. And I've begun to see, not because I feel that way, but I can see more of what's going on when you look at Paul's life here. You look at our world today, you just see all of the chaos and you think, Come, Lord Jesus, like we see in the book of Revelation. You look around and you say, surely this is the end times because look how bad it's gotten. Christians have been saying that for 2,000 years, by the way. When Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, it couldn't get any worse. When, the, when, when some of the trials and tribulations of the 1600s hit for Christians, they thought, surely the end is here. 20 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone yet, and Facebook had not gone public beyond colleges, and there was no such thing as social media. There's been a lot changed in 20 years, and they thought, surely the end was coming. Um, until Jesus comes back, we need to be ready. I want to be ready when Jesus comes back, but I don't want to check out before then. I've only prayed for Jesus to come back one time sincerely. And I've shared this before, but I was on my way to college, and I had a physics test, and I had not prepared. And I said, Lord, you know, uh, if, if you're ready, I'm ready. Like, let, if you want to come back, now's the time. I remember praying that. I'm not proud of it. I'm embarrassed, but I have to tell you, because we've all been there. We're like, I just, I'm kind of done. That's not a good reason for Jesus to come back. I just remember them all ready for Jesus to come back. And all I could think of were all the people I knew that had not become a follower of Jesus. All the people that I was investing in that I hoped to share the gospel with, that they would experience the joy that I faced. So I didn't want the, Jesus to come back at that point. I'm still not there. But I want to be ready if he does. Paul was ready no matter what. Um, 
So if he does live, he plans to be ready when Jesus returns. And if he doesn't live, he will be with Jesus. He was hard-pressed, but he knew either way he had a victory. So in a moment, we're going to continue with a time of invitation. I just want to give you a couple of next steps. Uh, maybe for some, it's the realization of prayer. Like you've really just kind of checked prayer off the box and you, you, you pray over meals and you don't really talk with God unless you need something. Um, that's called being a user of a friend. If, you're, if your friends only show up when they need something from you, that is not a healthy friendship. What kind of a friendship do you have with God? He's called a friend of ours. Um, Maybe for some, in a, in a li- at the end of the gathering, I'm going to mention, and we're going to have a list of all the students that are leaving for camp tomorrow. And I'm going to invite you to pick a kid's name or a leader's name and pray for them this week every day. Maybe that's where you start. Maybe for some, it's uh, seeing you on Wednesday night. I get to be back on Wednesday night. I can't wait. It's been six months. I might <laughs> leak from my eyes or explode. I don't know which one's going to happen when I get to be here with you this Wednesday night. But I know it is a special time when we pray together. And if you're not been coming to that, you're missed, and we need you there. It's not about numbers or anything like that. It's about fellowshipping together. It's about lifting each other up. It's about worshiping together. There's something powerful that happens when a church begins to pray together. Uh, maybe for some, you're hard-pressed. You're facing those decisions. Maybe it's a chronic illness, and it's not an, as easy as saying, I'll just stay around a little while longer. If you're facing those kind of things, chronic pain, you know, you're praying, Lord, take me home. Until he does, can you trust that he's not done yet? And what will you do to give him glory through that? And that is not something I say lightly. Um, but maybe you're here and you've, you, know, you can't say to live as Christ. That can't be said of you. If you're a follower of Christ and you're missing out on the joy that you were created for, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for your sin. If you've never surrendered your life to, to Jesus as your king, to place him on the throne of your life, then... There is nothing else that we can talk about. That's what we need to be talking about. I want to encourage you to make Jesus the king of your life today. Don't miss it. That's why everything else comes together because Christ is enough. And if you need help with that, I'm going to be available in the front. In a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to come here to the front. And as we sing, uh, some may come and pray at the steps. We call it the steps of the altar because it's, an altar was a place to do business with God in the Bible. If you need to do business with God today, we make a deal. No one's going to be talking about who walks through the altar or not. But there's freedom to respond. But if you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Christ and you need help with that, you want to do that, I'm at the front. Just say, I want to become a Christian. Come down front and say, I want to follow Christ. I'll know what you mean and we'll start there on this journey. But don't miss the opportunity to respond to what God is doing in your life today. He is worth it all. Paul tells us that. We've seen it through Paul's life and he could say time and again, Jesus is enough. I hope you can say that with him today as we worship. Let me pray for us and we'll continue. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts right now. Lord, that your, your truth would be what we are changed by right now. Lord, I pray anything I said that was distracting, let it wash past our ears. But God, I pray that your truth would sink deeply into our hearts. And that it would change us. Lord, help us be a people that others can say for us to live is Christ. Lord, help us to keep you on the throne of our hearts. I pray for those that don't yet know you. I pray they'd, they'd call on your name today. And I pray that you do it in such a way only you get credit, only you get glory, and you get honor through all of these things. And we ask this in the only name we know how, the strong name of Jesus.